I had a couple messages today. I'm not going to preach them both. <laughs> I was asking the Lord which one it was going to be. One of them is uh, a little more sobering than the other. And uh, I feel inclined to preach out of the Old Testament now. As opposed to the book of Revelation. Where I was uh, spent most of my time studying. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come into your presence in congregational worship. Lord, where your body is formed. Lord, we pray that you would move on us, that you would reveal more of yourself to us today. Lord, our desire truly is to see your face, and we know that that can only happen if, if we die. No one has seen your face. Lord, I pray that we would die to ourselves and that we would live for you that we would seek you with our whole heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, as many of you may know, we went to a conference Friday and Saturday, and it was excellent. It was good, and there was opportunities. I'm hoping that there's a testimony that can be given today by those who attended, maybe what it meant to them and how it maybe reinforced some of the things that we have already discussed through God's word. One of the things that uh, is very pressing on my heart is the reality that we are in this uh, pullback in Satan's agenda for global dominance. Having said that, I'm prayerful that we not fall asleep during this time. The pressure is light lightening up if you go to the store, nobody's requiring you to wear a mask. Some people are still being pressured at their works, uh, workplaces. And so I just want us to remember that there is a, a war that has been declared on the church. And that's the reality that we're, that we're dealing with right now. And with any, any conflict or combat, when that pressure or resistance gets too hard, you can bound back your position to find a more fortified position and flank your enemy. I don't want for us to get caught in that crossfire. I want for us to be vigilant, hallelujah, vigilant. God has called us to do mighty things. He has placed a purpose in all of us. Do you know what your purpose is? I'm hoping that uh, if you know, hallelujah, I pray that you would exercise uh, the gifts that God has given you in that purpose that he's given you. If, he, if you don't know what your purpose is, I'm hoping that we can find out what that is together and that we can deploy you into the efforts of Christ's cause. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I was centered in the book of Revelation and I've been spending a lot of time in the book of Revelation because I believe that we are uh, at the, the precipice of the, the unbreaking of the seals and for these things to unfold right before our eyes. But I'm trusting that the Lord, with his great mercy and grace and abundance of patience, and he has been very patient with his church, especially in America, that we have this opportunity to uh, make some changes in, in our own lifestyles so that we can live as if the Lord is returning. Do you believe that he's returning? Well, I want to be found faithful. How about you? I want to be found faithful. Um, I ultimately found myself in 2 Samuel this morning, and that's where we're going to, uh, to what we're going to look at today. And this comes kind of on the heels of Pastor AJ uh, expressing to us that we might be too dignified. Well, it's good to be uh, orderly and conduct ourselves in such a way that's becoming of a Christian without a shadow of a doubt. But this time that we come together is something special. There's times of prayer, there's times where we're going to pray over one another and give testimonies to the glory of God and how he's working in our lives. And it will be an encouragement to you as you see God working in other people's lives because maybe you're going through a test right now. And as we all know, during times of testing, the teacher is always the quietest. There's things that the Lord has already instructed us in his word that we can exercise daily. 
living our lives, even if you don't feel that you're hearing from him right now, quite possibly your faith is being tested. And in those tests, we grow. And how many people want to grow in their faith? Amen. Amen? Ultimately, this boils down to you being able to trust him regardless of the circumstances. And the circumstances that are being presented to us out in the world today are pretty tough, pretty tough stuff. And so I'm thankful that my faith is growing, my trust in him, even to the point as I read through some of the warfare that takes place in the Old Testament, I see this uh, amazing trust in him when, when all the odds seem stacked against uh, these godly men and godly women. And it would seem as though some things are stacked against us. The problem that we experience, I think, is that we begin to dwell on those things more than we dwell on the God who preserves us, the God who protects us, the God who empowers us. We can focus on those things so much so that we try to rationalize every move and ultimately find ourselves despondent, displaced, discouraged, and sometimes depressed. And that's not a place of effective Christian lifestyle is to operate from that place. Satan is attempting to try to get the church to be intimidated, to be divided. The church has been invaded in many ways with doctrines that are tossing people to and fro. Sadly enough, the church in many ways has compromised itself and has acting more like the world and the culture than it's acting like Christ's body. Christ's body is powerful. You know that, don't you? So as I'm thinking about our times together, and I would love to, uh, I'd really love to kind of go into a more sober message <laughs> in Revelation. I'm hoping that the Lord will use this as he's given it to me and then has really kind of instructed me to focus on this. So I want to be faithful, although my notes are very underdeveloped. <laughs> I don't want to speak too extent. <laughs> I'll set this right here. You're so cute. Don't, the wind don't blow. No, I think that this was very quick to be placed in my heart. The Lord had put this on my heart and immediately I just began to write down some of the things that, uh, that I was sensing that he wanted me to talk about this morning. So there's not a lot there. I don't want to be too extemporaneous and, and extend this message well beyond our ability to pay attention. But I feel inclined to read 2 Samuel, uh, 2 Samuel uh, chapter 6. It's only 23 verses, so if you have your Bibles, look at 2 Samuel chapter 6 with me, and I'll attempt to uh, read some of these names properly. Again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000, and David arose and went with all the people that were with him in uh Baali of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gilbea and Uzzah and Ahio, the son of Abinadab, drave the new cart. And they they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was in uh, Gebeah, a court, uh, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps and on psalteries and on uh, timbles and on cornets and on cymbals. Full band. And when they came to uh, Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error, and there he died by the ark of God. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah, and he called the name of this place uh, Perazuza to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. 
That's almost healthy sometimes. Amen. Amen. And said, how shall the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David, but David carried aside into the house of Obedidim, the uh, Gittite. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obedidim, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed uh, Obedidim and his household. And it was told, uh, and it was told King David, saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obedidim and all. Uh, that pertaineth unto him because the ark, uh, because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Abedidim into the city of David with gladness. And it was so that when they that bear the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was girded with a linen ephah. So David and all of the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of trumpet. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, uh, Michal, Saul's daughter, uh, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And they brought, it, uh, they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in his place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And as soon as David had made an end of offering, uh, offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. And he dealt among all the people, even among the whole multitude of Israel, as well as to the women as men, to every one a cake of bread and a good piece of flesh and a flagon of wine. So all the people departed, every one to his house. Then David returned to bless his household. And Mechel, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaidens of his servants, and one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovering himself. And David said unto Mechel, it was before the Lord, Amen. which chose me before thy father and before all his house to anoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore will I play before the Lord and I will yet be more vile than thus. I will be based in mine own sight and of the man's, uh, maid servants which thou hast spoken of. Of them shall I be uh, had in honor. Therefore, Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no child unto the day of her death. Father, I pray that you would bless this word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So much of the time when we actually talk about dancing before the Lord and being undignified, this is the, the reference that we make. And we have to picture what's actually happening. The Ark of the Covenant had been gone for some time. The Philistines had taken this and they were carting it around as if it was some trinket, a spoil of war, if you would. And ultimately it was uh, returned in the sense that David fought mighty battles with them and were able to win it back. Now, as I think of this, I also think of an illustration. It was told of a story of a woman who uh, bought a ham. And every time she would buy the ham, the children would notice that she always cut the tip of it off, a good piece of flesh off the, off the top of it, and would cook it. And so one of the daughters, as she grew up and got married, she would buy the ham and she would cut off the tip and she would put it in the oven and would cook it up. And her children asked, why do you cut the tip of the ham off? And she said, well, I don't exactly know. So she called her mother and she said, why do we cut the tip of the ham off when we cook ham? And she said, oh, sweetheart, I just had a pot that was too small. <laughs> Sometimes we can get locked up in traditions. We can do things a certain way because we've always done it that way. And we don't really realize until we begin to ask, why do we do these things? Why is our service set up to where we start off in worship? And then we go into the message 
And then we have announcements. Our services are a little bit different. We've mixed it up a few times, but we can be guilty of getting into a tradition as well. Back to our story. The tradition had been that the Ark of the Covenant was being carried by oxen. It had been carried around just like all the other idols of the Philistines, and it was just another piece. David was making the mistake of carrying around something holy and precious in the same manner that heathens were doing it. And so we see it unfold where as it was being led, by the way, if it's not led by men, it's led by animals, it doesn't respond exactly as it should. When things are carried in the church as if it were a business, carried by man's power, which is animalistic, I would just say, to make that connection, then it's not powerful. It's animalistic. I'm not asking that we start throwing ourselves around when we worship, but I am praying that we get to a place where we understand who we're worshiping and that we wouldn't get so locked up in traditions. Things are changing in the world around us. The church has been asleep and has been slumbering. It's been carrying on as it always has. It's been following traditions and it's been worshiping traditionalism. Some traditions are good. Traditionalism is an idol. We don't wanna be caught up in that idol. I don't worship that way, pastor. That's just not how I work. Well, I'm hoping that changes. I'm hoping that the way that you've worshiped does change. But I want to help in understanding what's actually taking place here. It's not that there's a lack of order, but it's the focus of David's adoration. Sometimes when we come to church, brothers and sisters, we have all the world on our backs and we have next week that we're already carrying on us. And we come in here And we think that we're just going to have this time where we get a good word. Maybe we can sing some songs, have a nice fellowship and get about unpacking that backpack that's on our back. I'm praying that we can come together. I'm praying that if we uh, get energized by the Lord more so than we've been in the past, that we can make some changes in the world that's taking this sharp turn and a window is closing for the church where we may have to take it underground. In some states, it's very odd just to live in freedom. Isn't that right, Yolanda? We know of other states. I don't know exactly what state you guys are coming from. I'm glad you're here. But you've seen it. You know what I'm talking about. This is America. We've been blessed to be born here. But we know persecution is taking place all over the place, all over the world. So here's what I'm seeing in this. David initially, when they're getting the ark, is a king. And he's dressed up in his kingly robes. And he is sitting there organizing and orchestrating exactly how this is going to be done. And they're going to carry the ark into the city of David, just like the pagans have been carrying the ark not under the instruction, under the poles, under the men who carry the glory of the Lord and the Ark of the Covenant. And so Uzzah goes ahead and he's going to lay hold of this. Maybe he wanted a special blessing. Maybe he wanted to do things his own way. But I'm telling you right now, it ended right there. The Lord wasn't playing games. And Uzzah lay dead, probably still clutching part of the Ark of the Covenant. Pretty scary scene. And when it says it displeased David, I think that David was more displeased with himself than anything else. Are you pleased with your walk in the Lord? Is it as vibrant as it has ever been right now? Are you excited to be serving the King of glory, the maker of the universe? The one who all good gifts that you have come into your hands, come into your home, the blessings that flow through you. This God, this amazing God that we serve, who loved us so much that he sent his son to die because we couldn't do it. 
that zeal and excitement to serve him. My, oh my. It's pretty amazing when we become dignified, isn't it? Dignified in our Christianity. Dignified in the knowledge of his word. Dignified in the times of worship. David changed something. And the word of God is telling us that ultimately the next time we see him, we see him in a priestly ephod. He had taken off his kingly robe. He had taken off everything except for the undergarments and the ephod, the priestly ephod, and began to put the ark under, under basically under uh, the instructions that was given to him, under the poles, under men, bringing it in, making sacrifices before the Lord. He changed things. And in this, he walks through a process, I think, that we could learn something from and glean. We say that we're thankful for things. Amen? Don't we? But we almost take it for granted. It's like I'm thankful, but I kind of deserve it. I've I've worked hard. I've put in the time. I've... Put it, I've gotten the education to be able to do this. I, I'm actually doing pretty good. No, no, thank you, Lord, is more of the thankfulness that we give. It's very difficult for us to pay lip service to the Lord because he sees it. And I don't want to pay lip service to the Lord, especially in these last days. I do not want to go through the motions of being the church in a world that's dying without any effectual change that God is making in people's lives because of our witness. I am thankful that God saved me. And I am thankful that he has put me into his service. I am thankful that he has given me a mind of Christ. I am thankful that he's continuing to sanctify me and make me more like him. I'm thankful. I'm thankful. And I don't take that for granted. But I'll have to admit, if we can all admit it, there are times where we do take it for granted. Things get kind of good in our life. And yes, we're thankful, but we're doing pretty good. We want to give ourselves the accolade. This is the king of Israel who realizes, you know what? I know what I'm doing wrong here. I am king because God has anointed me to be king and nothing else. I was a little bitty boy. I was a scrawny little runt. And if God hadn't done something amazing there in that field with Goliath, I would have been crushed and smitten. David realizes... I need you, Lord. What have I been doing? What have I been doing? So this, in this time of, of worship, to get to this point where, where he's undignified, at least by uh, Mikhail's point of view, obviously she's probably a little disgruntled being Saul's daughter, but he's not exposing himself as we think someone is exposing themselves. But the ephod is a chest plate and a back plate, and it's got latchets on the side. And so he has undergarments on the side, which is already, it's like, why don't you have your robe on? And you have undergarments as opposed to, he had gotten himself where he was pretty humbled being the king, don't you think? And I think in a point of worship, We worship the Lord when we walk down the street. Do we not? I hope that we do. It might look a little bit different than what we have the opportunity to do here, but we are in constant adoration for him, are we not? I hope so. Because when you get into a place of of adoration to the Lord, you can't help but speak of him, of his glory, of his magnificence in all situations over every issue that's going on in our lives. When we retract and we start thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to because of some position that we have, it's some organization that's out there that's ultimately going to be part of the system that you're ultimately going to leave. I hope that you're not trying to build your identity in the place that you work. I hope that our identity is built 
in Christ alone. It's going to need to change. The churches today, people are really proud of their churches because of how big they are. People are proud of the churches that they attend because of the programs they have. They're proud because of the number of views that they get weekly. I'm telling you what, I think these mega churches are going to be just like many of the churches that put up swastika flags and said, hey, we're on your side. When you start coming after Christians, don't come after us. We're with you. I am not with them. I will never be with them. I will die for Christ's sake if I have to. There are certain things that I've already drawn a line in my own life that I will not do ever. Not going to do it. You're going to worship. It's only for 30 days. We need you to worship this for 30 days. I will not do it. You can cast me into a pit and I'm going to praise the Lord if lions tear me apart. Now, we probably don't have to worry about that. Is anybody here afraid of dying, by the way? The psychological trick, try to get you to raise your hand. <laughs> I am not afraid to die. I look forward to the day that I die. I pray that I can do something for Christ's sake in this world that would get me killed. I'm not interested in putting my anchors here, brothers and sisters. I want to see Christ's kingdom grow. But you know what actually people fear more than anything else? They don't fear death. As a believer, you don't fear death. It's not that you're going to go out and jump out of a plane or something. Oh, I've done that before. It's kind of fun. I didn't think I was going to die. We don't want to be tortured. We don't want to be incarcerated. We don't want the loss of our family members for an extended period of time. We don't want to be in isolation and things like this. So what? For his glory. For his glory. For his glory. We are so spoiled, brothers and sisters. As Americans, think about it. Look at history. Look at what's going on in other countries. There is a window that's closing out there right now and the church is going to do something or the church is going to be banished. And it's closing right now on us. In this reprieve, I want to encourage you, don't fall asleep. Don't hit the snooze button. This isn't going away. We have to be more vigilant than we've ever been as a church. Hallelujah. And I'm talking about the church at large. Let these other ones close if it needs to. If they're dead churches, let them die. Let the doors close. We need a building. Hallelujah. <laughs> Take my keys off. I'm jingle jangling up here. That actually might have been really good for what I'm about to do. I don't know that I'm going to do anything. Except for this worship and adoration. To get to this place of worship, it starts with thanksgiving. It, chart, it starts with true thanksgiving. Enter into his courts with, anybody? Thanksgiving in your heart. When we come to church, we don't necessarily come to church with thanksgiving in our heart. We come with the worries of the world. We come with maybe some, I'm glad to see some folks or whatever it is, but thanksgiving in our heart for getting us through a week, for breath in our lung waking us up this morning, for the, the friends that we have, for the, the spouses that we have that, that encourage us. We should be thankful. And coming to church, we should be thankful. Come to that place where we're thankful. 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 We can elaborate on Thanksgiving all we want. But he's thankful. And he's realizing this. I truly believe, without a shadow of doubt, He's thankful. We can read through the Psalms. I can go into scripture upon scripture and run this an hour long and I can show you how thankful he is as he was pursued by Saul, hiding in a cave. He ultimately realizes that God has preserved him through all this and he was arrogant enough for a moment there as we're seeing here to go, <laughs> I'm the king, look at me. Look what I've done. Look what I've got. Thanksgiving. He begins to enter into this place of praise because it's seen. It's something that he actually sees. 
He gets a thankful heart, and I know it's thankfulness because he realizes to stand before the Lord, he's coming as a priest and not the king. Who's the king? You're the king. I'm not the king. You're the king. Sometimes we think of ourselves a little more highly than we ought to. And we've got to check that, brothers and sisters. You know, in God's sight, all of us are on an even playing field. If you know Christ as your savior, we all have this beautiful opportunity to enter into the presence of the Lord without coming through someone. You can go straight to him. Man, we should be thankful for that, hallelujah. If you had to come through me to get to God, I'm not always available. That's a really stinky day if you have a need, isn't it? It's like, oh man. If only Pastor Eric was available so that he could pray for me. You have a relationship with him and you can talk with him right now. Aren't you thankful for that? Amen. What an amazing thing that the veil has been removed. Wow, we should be thankful. He enters into this place of praise. Praise is something that's always seen. And if you start to praise without being thankful for what God has done with you, you are literally going through the motions. And we do this, other churches do it all the time, and you have to have a band. You have to have, have men, instead of the Spirit of God, you have, to have, you have to have a performance, you have to have the lights, you have to have the energy, you have to have the, the sound. It has to be loud, it has to be you know, something that's energizing you so it can stir up your carnality instead of your spirit. And people play along and they're like, oh yeah. Or they start to get into the beat and so they're jamming with it. And the culture invades the church to where they're singing secular songs because it's popular for the people. Itching ears. When we begin to praise, I pray that we're not just singing songs. That it's, that it's actual praise. It's like, I'm so thankful for what you're doing in my life. I'm so thankful that you, that we're secured for all eternity. I'm so thankful for the finances that I have. I'm thankful for the job that I have. I'm thankful that we're in a climate controlled environment because this time last year would have been really hot if we were still at Brushy Creek, hallelujah. I mean, we have so much to be thankful for. And we're so thankful as a church that God's body has come together. Anyone who has needs here knows that all you have to do is make mention of that need and someone is running to your aid to help the body. This hand gets hurt. This hand is a covering. Into the bosom it goes. And you begin to, to work on making it well again. We're so blessed. We have so much to be thankful for. So then when we begin this part of our, our time together in, in the Lord's presence, and we begin to sing, we begin to praise. It's true praise. It's not from any place that we're like, what is somebody thinking about me? I'm so glad that David, showed, David shows us here at the end of this particular chapter what he thought about what she thought. The Lord has given me so much. I can't help but praise him in this environment that is his ecclesia. It's his church. It's his body. We've come together. This is a place where the worries of the world can begin to melt away. And if we're smart and we're meeting at five o'clock, we'll allow that to happen through the process of the day. So that when we come together, we're already in that place of thanksgiving. And so that when it's time to praise, it comes very natural and very easy. Hallelujah. Because what leads next is going to be rejoicing. I, I wish I would have written down all these scriptures that are associated with this because I could preach on each and every single one of these by itself. And you know that. You guys are studied in the word. You understand that we are to uh, have the joy of the Lord. Amen. It leads to rejoicing. I'm so thankful for all that God has done. And I have this opportunity to praise you and lift up my voice to you. And you begin to rejoice as you praise. And this is me rejoicing as I'm praising. This little 
upward motion. You know, have you ever, I mean, do you do this at all when you're, when you're praising the Lord? You just kind of start, it's like, I can't get off the ground, but I kind of want to. Amen. I'm so blessed. Hallelujah. Yes, there's a lot that's going on in the world, but our God is in control. Hallelujah. He has already written it out. He already knows the outcome and he knows that there's this opportunity for us to do something. If my people are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. We know that, that there is this condition. When is the church going to rise up in power? This is more of the huddle, brothers and sisters, than anything else in our week. And when we come together, we should be encouraged. There is a word. This is God's plan. And, and as he's speaking to me, I try to, to help us with with some of the the practical applications as we leave here and we put our hands in and we're like, on three, Jesus, one, two, three, Jesus, let's go, boom. We head out there and we're just right back to what we've been doing instead of being transformed by this time together. The Lord's kind of giving us a half time right now, if you will, in Satan's plan for world domination. There are those that are working diligently right now and they don't sleep. They don't get preoccupied with their professions. They don't get preoccupied with games and all kinds of other stuff. They are working diligently to put these things together and they're wanting to do it in the next eight years. Agenda 2030 is as real as it gets. And I'm telling you right now, this pandemic, I don't think was supposed to hit us until 2025. But we had uh, a break in all of this with the uh, Trump presidency. And George Soros himself said that this is an anomaly. It'll be gone in 2030. So they actually released this thing early to mess up that election cycle. It really gave them some cover so that they could cheat the system. And they pulled no stops in the fraud that was in this election. If the church doesn't rise up now, no one else will. If the church does not rise up now in power and the authority that God has given us, there will never come another time. We will enter into a time that is very dark. We are going to watch the seals unlatch and we are going to see this thing unfold. And I'm telling you right now, I'm looking forward to the Lord's return. Don't get me wrong. But if you're not interested in that torture, that persecution thing, then it's really light tyranny right now. And there's a, a window of opportunity to turn these things around. And it's only going to happen with people getting saved people changing their mindsets. Their hearts have to be changed. Their soul needs to be saved. Their minds need to be changed. And we have to be very active in the church and being involved in what's going on around us. We can't just go to work every day and think that everything's gonna be okay. It's not. Has it worked yet? No, it has not. It's not a good plan. We're going to have to do more. It says here in the scriptures that he worshiped him with all of his might. And we talked about this last week. Do you remember the message last week? Anybody? I'll be preaching it next week. So just come back. I think I'll just keep recycling them on a monthly. I'll make four and I'll just keep tossing through them until you're like, oh yeah, didn't he preach this about a month ago? Oh yeah, I kind of get it now. I actually asked at the end of last week's message for you to do a few things. I ask for you to go out and encourage somebody every day, a different person. I asked you to invite someone to church. Amen. Share the gospel with somebody through the course of this week. We'll talk about it in a month. You'll have another opportunity if it didn't happen. Rejoicing. I'm very excited about what the Lord's doing. This is a very exciting time for God's people. Every generation that we can read about wanted to be our generation and they were very prepared to be that generation. And here we are ill prepared to be this generation that all of the saints wanted to be. They wanted to be in our place. And here we are. It's our turn. Hallelujah. It's our turn to make a difference in this world, to see God change things by our witness, by our testimony. Man, we're so blessed. 
Some of them are like, oh man, instead of amen. <laughs> From thanksgiving to praise to rejoicing, we enter into what's called this high praise, a high praise. Have you ever, some people will get to this high praise. Man, I'm so thankful that I picked a team this year that's successful. I'm so glad that, uh, man, oh yeah, run, 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 touchdown, woo, rejoicing. And then you win the game, the Super Bowl, and it's high praise, high praise. Man, this guy's undignified about a stupid football team. But we can't be like that for Jesus. No way. I'm a church. At church, my hands go up this high. They're, they're tied to my, to my sides. <laughs> I love children's laughter. I'm all undignified, mess up my stuff here. Make sure I'm okay. <sighs> high praise. High praise. Man, we Pastor AJ sings a song, and, and I, I've been guilty of not doing what I really want to do when he's talking about dance like David dance and just the whole beat of it and everything. And I just, I, I want to just move around here. And I think, oh, Mikkel, she's going to think that I'm being a disgrace. We get concerned about what other people are going to think about us if we actually just enter into this place of thanksgiving and we enter into this place of praise, and then we start to rejoice at all the things that God has done, and then we enter into this high praise, this high praise, and ultimately, it leads to where you're not thinking about anything. David didn't care who was around him or what he was seeing. He was in an ephod in his underwear, and he's dancing around before the Lord, pleasing the Lord, by the way, pleasing the Lord. But other folks, thinking other things, one, she was unthankful. Her life was spared. She was still in a king's court. Wow. Don't be thankful about that. She wasn't praising Yahweh, Jehovah. She wasn't rejoicing in the victory and reclaiming the Ark of the Covenant. This is an awesome thing. This is awesome. No, 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 I'm not going to rejoice in that. Give very low praise. As a matter of fact, give a low blow saying, oh yeah, what a king are you dancing around in your underwear? I'm not saying that any of us are going to say that, but sadly enough, sadly enough, we'll think that junk in church in the presence of God who's looking down on our hearts and we're concerned about what people think we're going to walk out these doors and we're going to begin speaking to people as a witness to what God has done in our life and we're going to be concerned about how they receive it my job isn't to be concerned about how they receive it my job is to sow seeds and I should be casting them to and fro and all over the place the Lord is the one that saves not me my job is to praise him for what he's done for me to have the zeal back that he's given me because i tell you right now if we can ever enter into a place here at cross life at this time where we are meeting where we can really get into a place of worship and adoration for the god who has saved us who has secured us who has provided for us who gives us guidance, who gives us insight, who allows us to see what's going on in the world. And you can spend time just like I have in the book of Revelation, just diving in, Lord, what's the next step? Where do I go? And he mentions something, you find yourself in the Old Testament, then you're in the New Testament, Listen to what he said about certain things in the book of Luke and the book of Matthew. And you're just, you start to get excited. It's like, okay, if this is going down, I wanna go down in a hell of fire, I want to go down in a blaze of glory. I want to go down as a man of God 
who has been faithful to the calling. I want to go down. If I'm going to go down, I want to go down with everything I've got, with all of my might. Now, you and I can operate as we wish in this world. But I want to be exercising temperance. Amen. But inside, as I'm explaining something to you, when I'm talking with somebody, by the way, I, uh, I can pause like I just did and I can listen to what they're saying and I can rationalize. I can draw conclusions based on what they said. I can express my thoughts and my opinions. I can reflect on scripture as the Holy Spirit draws it to my mind. But inside, I want to be bubbling over with this temperance that the Lord has given me. I want to be like, man, I just, you know, you want to be like that? No, don't you want to be like that? Have you ever been excited about something? Have you ever had a victory in your life that looked like you weren't going to get the victory that has almost seemed impossible, but yet the victory was yours and you just felt like jumping up. You just felt, hey, that's where it starts. Thank you, Lord. Woo! I need to go to church. I need to show somebody this stuff because I'm about to start praising him. And if I start praising him in this condition, I'm going to start rejoicing. And if I'm going to start rejoicing, I'm going to start high praising him. And next thing you know, you find yourself, I don't care who's looking. I don't care who's watching. I don't care what they say. I'm worshiping you, King Jesus. I adore you. I adore you. Hallelujah. Don't you want to be there? Don't you want to be there? It is so available to us. He has done so much. Think about it and begin to thank him for those things. Now, I'd like for us to actually have the beginning of our service at the end. I would love to do that. But here's one of the things that's going to hold us back. Even as I say that, if I said, Pastor AJ, come up here and, and let's do something that's going to bring us into this place of thanksgiving. And then we're going to see praise and then lead us into this. Lead us to the throne, brother. Lead us to this place where we are just excited and rejoicing in him. And then get to this place of high praise and then find everyone worshiping the Lord. So when we get to worship and adoration, this thing gets filled. Your seats are filled with tears. You're laying prostrate on the floor over here because you don't care what's happening. You don't care anymore. It's just, Lord, you have done so much and I am in your presence. And when we get into his presence, when we look in scripture, when we look in Ezekiel, when we look at Zechariah, when we look at uh, the book of Revelation, chapter four, we see John, we see uh, uh Daniel, they're all prostrate on their faces before the Lord, having no strength. John, staring at the floor in worship and adoration. Now, I'm not saying that that is going to happen here at Cross Life. I'm just telling you how it can. That's it. I'm not trying to, to push you or course you or convince you or persuade you in any way, except that God's word says something that will bless us. Will bless us. I'm not going anywhere. I'll be here next Sunday. I'll sit down with the Lord. I'll find myself in this state of worship and adoration. And the Lord will give me a word for his people. And I'm thankful for that. Do you believe that this is something that God wants for us? Yes. I do. I do. And we can, we can dance around the mountain one more time. We can walk around. We can. Or we can actually enter in. What else needs to happen in the world before we actually just surrender all? What more has to be taken away? What other restraints need to be placed on the church before we get to this place? Because I want to tackle the battle that's out there from this place and not angry. I certainly don't want to be bitter like Milka. I just don't. I want to be excited to serve the King of glory. Don't you want to be excited to serve him? It's like, oh man, this is happening. Yep, Lord told me. Here, it's right here in the word. It says right here. Well, they're going to do this digital currency. I know. 
it's right here. He said that's going to happen. Oh, they're talking about this uh, Chrislam stuff, this one world religion. <laughs> it's happening. But there's only one true and living God. The only access to the Father is through the Son. There's an exclusivity to salvation, but it's available for everyone. That's the inclusiveness of the kingdom. You just have to come through Jesus. Hallelujah. That's not too hard to say, is it? People need to hear it. They don't know. If people are actually asked the question, do you want to go to heaven or do you want to go hell? They'd rather say there is no hell because they know they can't get to heaven. But based on your behavior, are you going to go to heaven or hell? People, where do they want to go? They want to go to heaven. People want to go to heaven. And we have the key. We have the answer. His name is Jesus. Hallelujah. His name is Jesus. As we conclude our time tonight and go into fellowship, I want us to be encouraged. Amen. Amen. I would love to see next week every single person come here with this heart of thanksgiving and be so excited in anticipation that the Lord is going to bless us that you can't help but tell other people you need to be here next Sunday. I'm just saying, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. I just know that we're going with this heart of thanksgiving and we're going to end up rejoicing and we're going to be praising him and there's going to be this high praise and then there's going to be this word that just allows the Holy Spirit to convict us over things and it's so beautiful, so refreshing, so freeing that we go back out here more energized than we were when we came. Wow, hallelujah. That's what the world needs. See, the problem with the church today is it doesn't look dangerous to anybody and it doesn't look desirous to anyone. It's neither dangerous nor desirous. It's lukewarm. I want us to be red hot fire. Hallelujah. Red hot fire. So here's a conclusion. I'm done with my notes. (laughs) That is so good to us. What is preventing you from entering into that place? Is it, is it reputation? Is it, is it maybe just a, a small sense of spiritual pride? It doesn't have to be a bunch. What is your fly in the ointment? It doesn't have to be big, but it's definitely holding you back. And it also makes our, our worship stinketh, the King James says. I don't want to have this stinky, aroma to the Lord. I want it to be a sweet, savory smell unto the Lord. And if it requires us to be a little undignified, then so be it. If we get so excited that our shirts untuck, amen. Now I'm telling you, I'm pretty animated, but I'm not, I like dancing in one spot. If I'm going to worship personally, I'll tell you about me. I, I don't mind raising my hands. Hallelujah. I do this. But every, and my feet will start doing this. And I'll start, yeah, I'll say, yes, praise God. But for some reason, this movement here, stepping out, I get self conscious. Do you? What is it? We're supposed to be walking with the Lord anyway. I can worship the Lord. For some, other, for some of you, it's a sidestep. You have to sidestep out of the aisle. You get in the aisle so you have a little more moving room. I'm just saying, for others, you can't stand up to worship the Lord because you've come too far. You've done too much studying. You know God more intimately than anybody else in this room. Surprise, you're not preaching. And there's this spiritual arrogance that's keeping you from entering into this place of worship. For others, it's bitterness. For some, it's animosity towards me. I push you. I'm a pusher. I want people to do more for God. It's just in my heart. I want to do more for God. I'm not really satisfied for everything that I'm doing. I'm certainly not satisfied for what you're doing. And you resent me for it. Because I give you some tasks to go out into the world and share the gospel, the love of Jesus Christ with others. And you think, well, who's he telling me what to do? My, my. 
Maybe this altar needs to be filled with the entire church in every little small thing, anything. Maybe we can get these things right. But you want to touch the holy thing. But you don't want to do it in a way that's honoring to the Lord. Well, we see one person died and we see another person who is barren for the rest of her life because of bitterness, resentment, or spiritual pride. Please don't do that. Don't do that to yourself. Don't do that to your family. God caused those things. God is in control. I don't give a lot of credit to Satan anymore. I know that God is sovereign and I want to fear him, respect him. I want to know him. I want to see him. And if it requires me for to, to die to see him, then so be it. But Lord, I have to come to this realization as I'm studying this message for the brief moments that he gave me this morning. As I'm just looking at this and seeing this, he said, what's up with this? Why can't you do that? Why? It's in my heart to dance for the Lord, especially when the song is saying, dance like David danced. Dance like David danced. There are times in the song where we're talking about raising our hands and for some reason we're self-conscious to raise our hand. I lift my hands up to you, Lord but this is how we do it. What is up with that? Why are we not in this place of thanksgiving? In this place of, of, of praise? In this place of rejoicing? That it's not we're being told to do it. It's like, oh yes. You, maybe your hands are already up. And then there's, oh, they're singing exactly what I'm doing because it's already happening. I'm already there. Then all of a sudden the word when it's spoken is more vibrant and it means something and there's life transforming happening and there's healing taking place and there's demons being cast out because God inhabits the praises of his people. I'm just desiring for the church to rise up in these days and I just can't shut up about it anymore. Amen. I want to be excited for him. Hallelujah. And I know you do too, right? I want that. I need that, Lord. So, in our closing, I want us not to, uh, to sing anything at this moment in time, but just something playing. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what it is that's preventing you from giving all of your might if it's something I said, I'm going to make myself available right here. Please tell me. Let's pray together. If I need to apologize for something, I'm not too big to apologize. I just need to know. If that's happening with someone else, I'd rather us just sit down together and actually have a broken moment before the Lord, making sure that there's no flies in our ointment like it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 10. That's not pleasing to the Lord. Don't you want to please him? Whatever that is, let it go. If it's something in your, that you just need to talk with the Lord about, then have that conversation with him, please. Release it to him. If it has to take place with somebody else in here, go and sit down next. I know this is dangerous. I get it. I get it. But I want to be dangerous when we go out there. I want us to become desirous. Well, a world is like, what, what's going on there? The love that they have for each other, off the charts. What is going on? When we enter into a dark place, it's filled with light. Demons scatter at the name of Jesus. Let us not walk in his name in vain, saying that we claim the name of Christ over our lives, but there's no light. If the, light is, so if the light is in us, it is a great light. But if there's darkness in it, it is all consuming. We think that these small things are of no consequence and they're massive. Look at what's going on out there. Look what's going on in the world today. Some people get so upset about human trafficking. The immorality that is just everywhere in the world today. It's because of us, brothers and sisters. It's happening on our watch because we're not being the witnesses that God has ordained us to be. 
He has saved us. He has secured us. Amen. We are totally blessed. People need to know about him. And he wants to use us. And all the plans that he could have put together, he could have done something really awesome. But instead, he used us. He could have done it like this. But he says, I love you, Jennifer, and whatever that is, give it to me. Be free. Be alive. Be vibrant. Be on fire. Whatever that is, brothers and sisters, in this time, if you feel inclined to come up front here, hallelujah. If you feel inclined to kneel down in your chair, praise the Lord. If you need to stand up and sit down with somebody and maybe cry with them for a second and say, this is what I've been thinking. Let's be free, hallelujah. I don't want to play church. I want to be the church. Don't you? Amen? Amen. Father, Lord, please look upon us. Look at us, Lord. Look at these areas of our life that have not been surrendered to you. Look at, look at the things that we've been harboring, thinking that it's going to be okay. I'll get over this. But we're not. And we never will be unless we get this release. Lord, your body is to be working in unity without schisms. Lord, we ask that you would heal us today. We give you this time to move on our hearts. Lord, as we think about stepping out, there's going to be this thought of self-awareness and what will people think and what will ultimately happen. I pray, Lord, that we'll do what pleases you and we'll leave the consequences completely up to you. Good or bad, Lord, we know that it is for our ultimate good. Release us, Lord, into full service to build your kingdom. Let it not just be a show. Let it be real. In Jesus' mighty and holy name, amen and amen.